there are endings of all kinds which characterize and animate our life. There's endings of eras, of times, of, of, yeah. of course, relationships, obviously. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My ending seems to be coming by the minute. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so do we, we get the exclusive, Olivia? It's okay. That's right. Right. <laughs> Imagine the ratings if it happens now. <laughs> We, we made it actually, you know, that's it. <laughs> <laughs>
what I'm getting from a lot of listening to you, I mean, I, especially because I bought, I got your book on audio book and what I'm, I'm getting is there's something about the work you're doing, how you talk about the subject that it, it comes intellectually. Sometimes I might not understand it. It's more, it's, sometimes it's about a knowing rather than an understanding, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Well, I, I'm not a stranger to the consequence of the way I'm trying to approach these things. It doesn't come as news what you're saying, but, but I would suggest something along these lines, that if dying was simply enough information and that good dying was a purely a consequence of getting all the information you needed, well then in an information age, we would be awash in good death, if that's what it was. Yeah. But in fact, we have more information about dying than we've ever had before. And things are getting crazier still. So then you begin to realize that any devoted and disciplined contemplation of dying has to attend to its language constantly so that the language that you're employing enables the realities of dying to appear instead of being an antidote to dying or a soporific for dying or a distraction from dying. And where did I learn that? I learned that at the deathbed, literally at the deathbed when everybody around the dying person and the dying person themselves, they were devoted to crafting a language in which the realities of dying disappeared without a trace. And the most obvious example is using euphemisms as if they were synonyms for dying or avoiding using the D word. That was a classic. And, and the notion of this is this is an act of love, but what it is, is an act of obfuscation. There's no love involved. It, the motivation's irrelevant. I'm talking about the consequence. So the consequence of using a language that banishes the realities of dying when speaking with a dying person is equivalent to absolutely refusing to corroborate the pregnancy of a pregnant woman, as if reminding her that she's pregnant is somehow against the rules, or it's not considerate because she's getting bigger or you know, whatever the motivations might be. I took it upon myself as a, as a moral responsibility and as an act of radical citizenship to inhabit the lunacy of my times enough to craft a language for the realities of dying that served the dying people in a way that they were not seeking to be served. That's the tricky part. It's not as if, you know, I did this and all the dying people swooned with satisfaction and glee. <laughs> That's not what yeah. happened because the dying people are in on the obfuscation and in the very short term, it would appear to benefit them because it's gentler, softer, more oblique, you see, virtually impossible to follow and to track. But you can, the whole, the whole operation oozes a degree of, of comfort and, if I may put it this way, customer satisfaction. And, and this is what seemed to drive not only the professionals that I worked with, but, but as much the families and the friends and so on. And even the new age types who think, quote, they've read my stuff. When you listen to how they talk about it, there's a collusion still with the notion that our principal responsibility to dying people is to comfort them against the realities of what's happening, not to faithfully be a witness to the realities of what's happening and help them not lose track of their dying. And in that sense, we're kind of guides after the fact, not out in front. The image that has occurred to me in the past is something like this. The dying person has one of those old miner's headlamps, yeah? And they're in a dark place. Of course they are. Not just emotionally, but existentially as well. This is full of unknowns. So they have this miner's hat on with a dim, you know, candle and a little bit of reflected light. And I'm behind them. And I can't see a thing. And I have my hand on their belt from behind. And they're moving forward with that lamp and I'm asking them what they see. And between the two of us, we're trying to see if we can make our way. That's the job. Is it like you're using the same language with us? So, so you just told us a story, you know? Mm. Is it because using the same language with the dying and with us, does it mean that we 
you talk to us as a dying person as well? It, it's a good observation. Um, and there's a little caveat that I would use. If you're not careful, you become one of those small B Buddhists. You know, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I'll tell you what I mean. The, the routine response is, well, we're all dying. Now, look, if that's true, then what are you and I talking about right now? About life. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the distinction they like to make, as if there's a distinction to be made between death and life. But there's no fundamental distinction to make, because these are not the opposite one of the other. Death is not the undoing, the absence of life. It's the rest of life. Just as life is the rest of death. Life is conducted, conducted in the presence of death. Not in spite of it. <laughs> not until, but alongside. So when you say, we're all dying all the time, what you're actually saying is, there's no fundamental reality to dying. It's all a continuum, it's all the same, it's ever present. I'll tell you what, you can say that when you're healthy, but I've never heard a dying person say, we're all dying all the time, because they've tasted it now, and they know it's a kind of elixir that had never come to their lips until now, no matter what their per personal belief system was, and so forth, so yes, my way of talking about these things is an effort to be faithful to the realities of dying. And what I'm counting on is the people who are not dying now begin to recognize the kinship with death that death is proposing. So you can hear I'm talking about death as if it were a sentient being there with us. Well, it's not as if. It is. Uh, my, the best way I can think to say it is that dying is a god. Dying is a deity. That means that dying is bigger than what you think dying is. That dying is not the sum total of all your decisions and beliefs about dying. Any more than your dead parent is nothing more than a consequence of how you feel about them. Then and now. Now this is apostasy, at least in North America. It's absolute apostasy, what I just said. Because it, it says, look, man, the realities of dying are not overly concerned about your belief system, about how you feel about it. Perhaps a parallel could be drawn with dying and with marriage. A lot of people are going to laugh about this one, I guess. The parallel that I'm thinking about is this. You have reasons that you get married. None of those reasons survive the realities of being married. Why? not because you were wrong, but because of all your ideas about marriage came from never having been married. <laughs> so how can they be intelligent choices? They can't. You're a beginner. And you know it's proper that you assume some humility. And you can talk about your feelings all you want. But the truth is that the realities of being married make folly of your motivations for marrying. And if you can survive the loss of the reasons that you got married, you have a chance to be married now. So it's the same thing with dying. You bring all kinds of associations and feelings and beliefs and half-digested nonsense about it all. And none of it comes from the realities of dying. Now you're in the presence of those realities and your beliefs begin to look shaky and sometimes ludicrous and, and certainly unconsidered. That's the big one. They're simply unconsidered. So this is not a condemnation. This is just me advocating for the rest of the story to be allowed to appear. Mm -hmm. That you make room for dying by giving de death a seat in the banquet hall of your ebbing life. And here's, and here's why. Because if you don't give dying a seat, it usually takes the whole house. All it needs is one seat. But if you refuse to be a good host, for whatever reason, generally speaking, it will mistake the whole house for the seat that you fail to give it. What, what does that look like? Um, and again, it's just trying to make sense. So, because you said it about the people who, who have had a taste of death. It, it, it's immediately changed. And again, it's because all those concepts they had before 
uh, the folly of, of what they thought it might be like or what it meant, suddenly it shifted. How do we get to a point where, or, or, or is there, is there any, anything to be gained from getting to a point where we can get that understanding, that, um, that knowing without tasting it? I'm not sure that the qualification is without tasting it. But you could say, for example, without having to be dying yourself. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so here's how. And the beauty of this observation is it's in the architecture of life anyway. You don't have to be looking for a book called Die Wise or, or any other book or any other video or blog or anything. Simply it's this. Everyone's death before yours is your rehearsal. It's your chance to get it right, you see. If you stay away from that, you come to your dying as a rather wretched amateur, making as if this is the first time you've had no opportunity. Think, think of the phrase that we have in English, sudden death. This is an objection that's often raised against things that I say by interviewers and so on. They say, this is all well and good when you see it coming. And you can do all this crazy psychic work that you seem to advocate. What about sudden death? You know, doesn't that undo your whole thing? And that's when I get to say, what makes death sudden? And they say, well, you don't see it coming. And I say, do you see what you just said? Okay. So the notion of sudden death is a confession of truancy. It's not a description of death. It's a description of your utter unwillingness to live your life in its presence. Because it was there. It was there to be known. Your personal death is a guarantee. It is a companion if you've got any chops at all. I mean, that's a, that's a daring proposition, what I just said, obviously. So there's no such thing as sudden death. Sudden is a confession of truancy. Sudden is a condition of your unwillingness to know the knowable. Your dying is knowable. I grant you, of course, the day of your death, the moment of your death, the nature and the cause and so on. You know, for the longest time, this is not knowable at all. But I submit to you, there's mercy in that and there's grace in that. Because if you actually did know the day years in advance, what do you imagine it would confer? A sense of well-being, a sense of priority, that you would finally know what's important and what wasn't? Or would it drive you absolutely mad increasingly as you look at the calendar and crossed off another day. The fact that we know that we're going to die is mercy. The fact that we don't know when is mercy. They're not confounding. So the news that comes in comes to you by the grace of the demise of others before you. And in that sense, your obligation is to draw as close as you possibly can as often as you can. Here's a little story. Years ago, I had a woman come up to me after one of these talks. And she said, well, that's really great for other people, but it's not very useful to me. And I just nodded. And she said, do you want to know why? The honest answer was not particularly, but I think you're, <laughs> I think you're going to tell me. So go ahead. And she said, well, here's the thing. She said, it's just not useful to me yet because nobody close to me has died. And I looked at her, and I knew she, she was in her early or mid-50s. So this means this is inconceivable that no one close to her has died unless she hasn't been very close to people. And then it's true. But it's sorrowfully, lamentably true. She thought she was talking about dying. But what she was confessing is an unwillingness to live close enough to fellow human beings to be undone by their departure. Well, this is not peace of mind. This is the absence of peace of mind. And your real peace of mind comes in part from the ability to see the going away from you of things before it's your turn to go away. And when the time comes finally, you get to look up from the table and say, now? And if you're lucky, somebody close to you leans in really, really gently and says, now, there's nothing to wait for, and it's not in the future, and this is what it's like, 
and there's only the work of dying now. I would like to go back to what, one thing that you said just before regarding yeah. the death needs a seat next to you or something like that. If yeah. there's no seat, it takes over the house. So can you explain me that, you know, if you don't allow death to have a seat, then it's, it's, it's the entire house. How does it look like, this, this, what you just said? What it looks like is the way it is. The prevailing madness around dying that, that got me started in the first place, that prompted me to be involved in the making of Grief Walker and, and, and eventually the teaching and finally the writing Die Wise and so on, all of that stuff, talking to you now, this all comes from the madness of the time I was born into. So this is not hypothetical what I said about taking the seat or taking the house. The house has already been seized. And what does it look like? It looks like the way it is. This has already happened. I'm not foretelling the future. I'm describing from whence the madness comes. I mean, in one fashion. There's a lot of you know, things you can talk about soci socially and politically and culturally and so on. But for the moment, you know, this is a kind of poetic, mythic understanding I offered when I talked about the seat in the house. So it's like this, if dying is a god or a deity or a being with particularly consequential powers and presence, I think you could at least grant the last one. It's certainly that. Then there's a certain etiquette that ensues because you could say with some confoundment that death is a living thing, that it participates in all of the aliveness that we normally understand only ourselves to have. But death is as alive, as present, as powerful, as consequential, as, it, as you or I, certainly, probably more so. There's an etiquette that's in, that you can infer from that. It is come as your kind of unerring and faithful companion. It is come to your house. It doesn't barge in, it doesn't take over. But it's there. And a terminal diagnosis from a doctor helps you know that. But that's a piece of information. That's like being told that somebody's coming to visit you. And they come to the door and you open the door. And the simple information that they've come is all you do. You look at them and say, oh, there you are. And what you really should be doing is saying, I don't know if you drink where you come from, but if you do, you see, and so begins the courtship, which is kind of mutual. It's just impossible to see if you think death is a predator, if you think death is a thief and a sorcerer and an assassin, well, you're not going to offer him tea and crumpets. <laughs> you're going to be hold on for dear life to everything that's precious to you. But if you, look at it, if you look at death and say, are you the one that's always been around? What do we do now? And death could say, well, you take my lead, right? How do I do that? Well, how about stop making plans? One, two, how about agreeing that there's no such thing as a future? Three, if you agree that there's no such thing as a future, then you don't need hope. And you don't need feeling positive because all of that stuff is for the sake of a future. But look, you're actually alive, dying. It's not the opposite of being alive. You're a dying, living person. And you don't have to choose between them anymore. Now, finally, you get to be both. And it's not hypothetical, but you do, do have to learn the job description of a dying living person because chances are your cultural education didn't help you much with this now if you fail on all these matters or if you resist them or if you if you push back or if you try to be brave or you know perform your bucket list madnesses or whatever it is the chances are very good that you will experience the inability to extinguish your death as death's predation of your life. It's a complete misapprehension of what's actually happening. All it means is you can't solve it. That's all it means. It's not getting worse. 
you just can't solve it. Why not? Because your dying is not a problem to solve. That's why. Is anybody, I mean, you didn't wake up. How about this? You didn't meet somebody. You rather enjoyed the meeting. You were kind of happy about it when you thought about it. And then you say, God, how am I going to solve this problem of being happy to have met this person? Because now I've got the problem of being attracted to them. And what am I going to do now? And chances are, unless you're a crazy person, you'd never do that. But we reserve that kind of animosity and that kind of guardedness for the stuff we don't approve of. So the last, I know I've been dominating the, the discussion here, so-called discussion. Of, one last thing, and I'll turn it over to you as the guest, speaking of etiquette. And it's this, imagine the dying is not really doing anything to you, is just bringing the news faithfully too, not interpreting, just bringing you the basic news. The basic news is you don't have a future. You have nothing to strive for. You have no obligation to be positive or hopeful. You do have an obligation though to every other human being who's around you. And what is it? To die wise. Why? Well, you will not get a chance to live one consequence of your effort to die well. You won't. So you're doing it for them. Not so you can have a better outcome, but that people can see a sane and soulful alternative to dying miserable and tranquilized and antidepressed and sedated. That's why. Because in your death, the deaths of others to come is being crafted. It's an immense moral responsibility. And I would say an act of radical citizenship to understand that your death is in fact not your own death in any meaningful sense of the term. Your death is entrusted to you in the same way that, like I'm a farmer, in the same way that my farm is entrusted to me. I'm not taking it with me. I'm trying to care for it in such a way that it is in better shape to become the responsibility of someone further down the line than it was when I got it. My life is exactly the same thing. It's entrusted to me for a while. And when it's time for me to give it back, the act of giving it back has to be witnessed by others as something that's not rancorous and depressive and belligerent and hostile and so forth because if i do that i am casting a spell on the people who are witnessing that and the spell goes like this whatever you do don't die look what it's done to me and of course within two generations they're going to generate a pill or a serum or something and you take it and you won't die i mean that's coming there's no question about it do you think so oh there's no question about it yeah and, and the, the bad deaths are principally responsible for the seeking after eternal life. It's not the love of life that produces the seeking after as anti-mortality serum. It's the refusal to die and therefore the refusal to live deeply and temporarily. That's what generates the seeking after eternal life. The denying of the death, that we carry that with us all through our lives in that sense. And that, as I said, that clinging to life, that means we're unable to actually sit at the table with death because we can't sit at the table with something that we deny its, its, its existence. And, and it's a, this, the striving is coming from, coming from this, the same thing. I think it's important to use the word cowardice here now. And it's a very strong word, obviously. And it's, it's full of thou shalt not, obviously. But I'm suggesting to you that the unwillingness to inhabit the realities of dying before you get a diagnosis, before a downturn in your health, mm. all of that stuff, the refusal to do that is not loving life. It's loving the portion of life that benefits you. That turns you into a predator drone, picking cherries from the top of the tree, pretending that you love being alive. It seems to me the only people who can love life are the ones 
who are fully informed by its temporary nature. Because until you see the, the end of what you hold dear, I say to you, you're not holding it dear. You're benefiting from it, you're approving of it, you like it, all of that. You're pursuing it and so forth. It's good. It's not much, but it's good. But what about the rest of the story? Do you opt out of all of that stuff? What about the part of you, uh, excuse me, the part of the story that, that doesn't seem to benefit you at all? Then you realize you're not grateful for being alive. You're grateful for the good days. That's all. You, you're a kind of, you're practicing a kind of psychic apartheid and dividing everything up into what you want, what you don't, what works for you, what doesn't, what, what seems to be upside, what seems to be downside. And of course, we know where death fits in that kind of apartheid. It doesn't belong in a full life. Wait a second. Your understanding of full life is a direct consequence of the presence of your dying. It's not a direct consequence of having a, a lot of wonderful days. It's a direct consequence of seeing that they're limited and that they're numbered. And that's how you inhabit them. So yes, it takes something like courage to proceed in that fashion. Mm. And the unwillingness to do so says something about what kind of courage you were raised with, educated in, and have failed to practice. Uh, but isn't it what's happening today with our culture? You said, I think I've heard you said, uh, we live in a culture that doesn't believe in endings. A culture where everything is about happiness, about hope, about startups, about fame, about going fast, about, you, you mentioned transhumanistic as well, will never die if you, if, you, if, you, if you hear about these guys. But is it like living in denial, but what Kip said, we live in denial. And how that makes us truly uh, unhappy at the end of the day, because we still have this hope, because we still, have, we still cling to this, for this happiness and we're not accepting this human condition that we have. Well, I think the language of, of acceptance is, uh, it's overused. Okay. And I don't think it's very clear, clearly examined. It's a simple solution to a complicated adult scaled challenge. The simple solution is just say yes. But I'm not saying it's easy or preferable or beneficial to say yes to dying. That's not my advocacy. My advocacy is befriending dying, not accepting it. The best way I can illustrate that idea is to tell you a brief story. Many, many times I've been uh, interviewed over the years, the last 10 years in particular, and routinely this question comes to me and it goes like this. So they say to me, so you've worked with a lot of dying people. Yes, I have. And you've written a few things. Yes, I have. And been in movies that I did that. Yes, that's all true. And so somewhere along, you've seen a lot of death. Yes, I have. And so, somewhere in there, you must have seen your own death. Yes, I have. Many times. It's an occupational hazard or an employment benefit, you decide. <laughs> <laughs> and after a strained pause, the interviewer will say to me, so if you've seen your own death now, you must be good with it. That's the standard formulation. You must be good with it. I'm telling you that that's demonic. That sequence of reasoning is demonic. That's strange, strong language, I grant you. So here's what I mean. What makes you think that seeing your death somehow eases it? Where does that idea come from? Well, you know where it comes from. It comes from the understanding that the only things that really trouble us are the things that we don't get. But everything that we do get is wonderfully in alliance with us. It's complete bullshit, you know. Life does not work that way, and it doesn't divide up into stuff that works for us and stuff that is bad for us. So the beautiful thing about dying is it eclipses all of those categories. And I will say, I, and I can say this absolutely faithfully to you now, I have indeed glimpsed my death, the, the nature of it, the sound of it, the taste of it, and so on. And if you think I'm looking forward to it because I've seen it, you're nuts. I'm not looking for it. <laughs> you might think, yeah, but when it's there, you'll just be like that wise old guy sitting there. 
in diapers, you know, and it'll be a wonderful thing. And I'm saying to you, uh uh. And then they'll say to me, listen, I've had a dream. God talked to me. This is a true story. God sent me a message. He said, I should send you an email telling you that God wants you to film your death from three or four different places in the room and then broadcast it in real time. I mean, this is the kind of shit that I get all the time. <laughs> like I've, I've, I've volunteered to be a demonstration project for how to die in front of people. All joking aside, here's what I'm telling you. When I saw my death for real, I knew sadness for the first time. I mean, real grown up sadness. And that has never left me. From that moment until this moment, the, the prospect of me not being here anymore is deeply saddening because I have found life to be habit forming now. And I have a capacity to be alive now that I never had before I saw my dying. I never had it. I was a water skier imagining that I was swimming. That's what it's done to me. It's made being alive more precious than it was. And if you think I accept the fact that that's the deal, that you get to see how precious it is just as it becomes scarce, do I think that, I think that's wondrous architecturally, but I think it's, it's deeply sad making at the same time. So I have to look around at the people that are close to me here on the farm or my kids or whatever, and I have to see the ending of my time with them. And if I don't see that, the chances are I'll take it for granted as if it's kind of infinite until I agree otherwise. So I have no obligation to accept my dying. I do have an obligation to die though and to die well and wishing I wasn't dying when I am is not the same thing as refusing to die. It means I'll die as a living person who wished he didn't have to die right now. Something you said earlier, is that you said we can, we can learn how to die by the deaths of the people that have gone before us. Could you elaborate on that a bit more? Just to, again, what does that look like? How, does, how do we do that? First of all, I should expand it beyond the people who died before us. There are endings of all kinds which characterize and animate our life. There's endings of eras, of times, of, yeah. of course, relationships, obviously. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My ending seems to be coming by the minute. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so do we, we get the exclusive, Olivia. It's okay. That's right. it. <laughs> Imagine the ratings if it happens now. We, we met it, actually, you know, that's it. <laughs> it's every, it, I'm really not even talking about endings. I'm talking about limits and frailties. These things are around us our entire lives. Where I live, the reward system, psychologically, is to inch, defend yourself against frailties and endings and limits and so forth. And that's what the dot-com money is being spent on. I mean, those billionaires are planning to get to Mars when everything goes sideways because nothing should end. And they're working on the eternity pill because nothing should end. And here's the mystery. It's not people in their 60s and 70s who are spending their billions on this kind of stuff. It's people in their 30s and 40s. What's going on that people who are just at the beginning of the middle part of their life are already using their considerable influence and fortune to see to it that they get a prolonged last half, like a very prolonged last half. There's a certain irony in that, isn't there? <laughs> just... Yeah, there's just a definite iron irony in it for sure. So, so my, my point is this then, if either one of you have used the word divine in the last 48 hours, maybe you have, Maybe you haven't, but if you investigate what you meant by the word, just think about it now. What's, if you free associate with the word divine, I'm fairly sure that one of the things you would not come up with is limited, frail, ending, dying. This is, these are not terms that we equate with divinity and with um, 
holiness, and so forth. We, we imagine, and there's no mystery as to why, because it's in the nature of all monotheistic understandings to insist that the real thing doesn't end, isn't limited, can't make mistakes, can't be wrong, can't suffer, can't be lonely. That's all our problem, which makes us a stranger to the one we allegedly come from when you have that kind of cosmology. So I'm imagining instead, if that's what makes divinity, the absence of limit and so on and all that, then I ask the simple question, where does humanity come from? And my, the obvious answer to me is, our humanity comes from our limitations and from our frailties and finally from our dying. This is where our humanity is most explicitly articulated or not. There's the challenge or not because dying belligerently and all the rest is the place where your humanity goes to perish. And that's why I talked about it as a moral obligation to your fellow citizens, that your, that your humanity is most available to them as your physical and psychic availability is beginning to wane. It's not an amazing formulation. I've never thought of it that way until I just said it to you. And if it's not true, I'm going to go on record as saying it should be true. But I've rarely seen it, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. It's deeply possible. You're amazing. <laughs> You're really. And please don't die. You know? <laughs> <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Again, please support the show by signing up at deathhangout.com or clicking on the subscribe button on your screen.